Sometimes I feel totally inadequate as a pastor. Sometimes I think to myself, I don't really think that God can use me. I don't know if God can use my gifts. I don't know if I have the skill set or the talents to be able to do what God's called me to do. And I feel inadequate. But the truth is, I don't just feel inadequate or insecure in this area of my life. But the truth is, I feel inadequate and insecure in many areas of my life. Sometimes I feel inadequate as a husband. I feel insecure as a father. In fact, as I was thinking about it over the past month as I was working on this teaching, there are very few areas in my life that I haven't felt some sense of insecurity. I mean, it's just the way that it is. Now, many times, uh, I'll even tell myself, I doubt if God could use me in this area. Now, from the outside, you might look at me and you might say, wow, Chris, like you're, you're a pastor of a growing church and you have a great wife and you have wonderful kids. But the truth is, if you were to pull back the layer of the facade that sometimes I have on, what you would see is someone who's very insecure and he's hoping just to make it through one more Sunday. Sunday. I mean, you imagine this, having a final paper due every single week and people are watching you. That's the insecurity that I have. And the truth is, is that as I've shared over the past couple of weeks, occasionally I do doubt God, but more often than not, I doubt myself. Can anybody relate to this? Yeah, that sometimes I have a tendency to doubt myself way more than I do God. Now, for those of you who ever feel insecure or who feel inadequate, I want to share with you a powerful verse in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And it says this, for we are God's what? What's the next word? Masterpiece. For we are God's, what is it again? masterpiece. Folks, each person here in the auditorium and every person on the stream, you are God's masterpiece. You are a Rembrandt. You are a Monet. You are a Picasso. You are one of a kind. Now, for some of you, we're glad that God only made one, okay? Like, one's enough. You are perfection, I guess, because one of you, that's all we need. But you are God's masterpiece. And the scripture goes on to say this. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You were created in the image of God. Every single time that you look in the mirror, God says, there's my masterpiece. The question is, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And he decided long ago, long before you were ever born, how you would come about in this world. I mean, regardless of the circumstances of your birth or who your parents are, or maybe you had no parents growing up and you were a foster kid and you were around different homes or you were adopted or whatever your situation might be, God had a plan for creating you. And it was for you to use your gifts and your talents and your passions to make a difference in this world. Because you are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. In fact, I'd like you in the auditorium to look at the person beside you. All of you on the stream, you can type it in. But just tell the person beside you, you are God's masterpiece. Go ahead, tell them. Now, here's the problem, though, that as you begin to step in to this direction of believing that you are God's masterpiece, your spiritual enemy, the evil one, is going to want to put doubts in your head. He will begin to start planting seeds of doubt in your head, and he'll remind you, no, you're not his masterpiece. You know what you are? You're a master mess. That's who you are. And you're not good enough. And you don't know enough. 
and you're not ever going to be enough. You are just a person who will never measure up. That's who you are. And these lies will come one after another after another. So whenever that happens, and it will happen, I guarantee, when that happens, what I want you to do is memorize kind of three thoughts that I want to share with you today. Three biblical thoughts to help you when those lies come to you. Now, these are thoughts that come from this particular question, who does God most often use? When it comes to you and to me, who is it that God most often uses? Well, there are kind of three thoughts around this, and this is the first one. This is your first fill-in for those of you on the stream and everyone here in the auditorium, if you want to put it in your program, it says, God uses the insecure. God uses the insecure. Now, uh, in a moment of honesty, how many of you would say, yeah, you know what? Um, I have some insecurities in my life. Go ahead. Just raise your hand. Uh, tell on the stream, I'm insecure. Raise your hand real quick. Okay, put your hands down. Now, everybody who didn't raise their hand, what do we call them? Liars. Yeah, exactly. You're a liar. You are a liar. Every single human being that I know of, you have insecurities. I have a lot of insecurities. And this is all I want to say, is that if you have insecurities, that's really good news. Because you're a great candidate to be used by God. God loves to use people who are insecure. In the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, God calls a guy by the name of Moses who was very insecure. And Moses had actually some really big insecurities. God calls him to deliver his people from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. For 400 years, the Israelites had been in slavery. All they had ever known was being a slave. And God comes to Moses one day and he tells him, hey, I want you to deliver them. I want you to go to Pharaoh and speak to him and speak up and tell him exactly what I want you to say. And in Exodus chapter 4, after God calls Moses to do this, Moses pleads with him by saying this, Oh, Lord, I'm not very good with my words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. In other words, God, I'm not the best man for this. I am not a very good speaker. In fact, I stutter. It's bad. I mean, if I get in front of a crowd, I will freak out. You should choose someone else. I'm not the right man for this job. Believe me, and you can feel the insecurity that flows out of him. Before I became a pastor, I had one New Testament class that I had taken. That was my training. And in fact, if it had not been for Kathy Keener, I don't know if Kathy's out there, but Kathy, if you are, um, thank you for letting me copy off your page. Cause had I not done that, I would have failed New Testament, guaranteed, no doubt about it. And I was very inadequate. And yet this church was really desperate. This little country church was desperate. And they asked me to come and to be their pastor. One New Testament class. And I'll never forget the very first day, um, they said, this is your office. And I was sitting behind this great big wooden desk. And all of a sudden it hit me. Smart people sat behind this desk. People who knew the Bible sat behind this desk. People who had integrity and didn't cheat off of Kathy Keener sat behind this desk. And now all of a sudden, I was sitting behind this desk and I was feeling the pressure and I felt extremely insecure and inadequate. I was thinking to myself, these people are expecting for Sunday to come and for me to say something that was going to be life changing for their life. And I had nothing, zero, nada. And so I started looking through the Bible. I'll never forget this. And I looked at it and I saw this book called Job. And I thought to myself, I need a job. That's what, I, maybe I got the wrong job. Maybe this will explain how I can do job. And 
Then all of a sudden I learned it's not called job, folks. It's called Job, okay? And I felt very, very inadequate about this whole kind of thing. And yet I was going to have to do something on that particular day. I felt so insecure. And quite honestly, when I still stand up here each Sunday, people say, do you get nervous, Chris? Every single time. I wonder if I'm ever ever going to be able to share something that's meaningful to your life. And now the good news is I don't throw up like I do before. That's really good for you down here, okay? Like you're not going to get that anymore, you know? Um, but, But folks, I do feel very insecure. And I've often felt insecure. And I often feel like what I have is not enough. That what I can do isn't enough. But this is what I found, that in my inadequacy, it actually makes me a better candidate to be used by God. Because it's in our weakness where God often does his greatest work. It's not in those areas where we think we have it all together. It's in those areas of weakness that God does his greatest work. Because it's through our weakness and our insecurities that all things are made perfect. And there's more room then for him to work in those areas where we know we don't have it all together. And we learn to find our confidence. God, if anything's going to work, it's going to be through you rather than having confidence solely just in ourselves. Because he loves to work in the midst of our insecurities. Now, back to Moses. Moses comes up and says, "Uh, uh, God, I, I just don't know how to speak. And God's like, uh, well, watch what I do now. Listen to what God says directly to him. Verse 11 and 12. The Lord said to Moses, who gave man his mouth? Is it not I, the Lord? Then God said to him, now, and what's the next word? Go. Now go, and I will what? What's it say? Help you. God said, I will help you. I will help you. Let's say this phrase out loud together. One, two, three. I will help you. I will help you. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. But Moses, you must first go. You must go. You must take a small, small step. Just one little step and go. So, God loves to uh, use the insecure. Secondly, he loves to use the most unlikely. God loves to use unlikely people. God loves to use people that other people overlook. God loves to use the folks who many other people overlook. Now, for those of you who are more like my wife, you went to high school and you were real popular. You were voted most likely to succeed. You got all A's. Maybe you were the head cheerleader. Maybe you were the starting quarterback. Maybe you blew the SATs out of the water. Maybe you were the valedictorian or the salutatorian. Um, I just want to tell you that God can still use you too. He can. It's a little bit harder. He can still use you, but God actually, he specializes in using people that other people overlook. He loves to use people and to work in their lives, those who others don't believe in. There's a story in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel's in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, and Samuel was a prophet. He was a person who spoke on behalf of God. And God said, I'm going to send you now to a family and I want you to anoint or call the next king. And Samuel was so excited to have this opportunity. And he goes to this family. The father's name was Jesse and he had eight sons. Now, Jesse was so proud that he introduces Samuel to his oldest son. Jesse always knew this boy was going to make it. He was going to make it big. He was destined for greatness. 
And he was the president of his class. He was the quarterback of the football team. He was the most outstanding CEO in the country at the time. And he pulls up in this vehicle a Lamborghini. And when that guy walks out, it's like everybody knows, yes, look, this guy's got it together. He steps out of the car and he has a commanding presence. And Jesse says to Samuel, this is my son, Eliab. Now, do you know what Eliab means in the Hebrew? It means you demand. That's what it means. You demand. No, actually, doesn't. don't tell anybody that. I don't know what it means. I have no idea. But, but the truth is, everybody knew Eliab, and they knew that he was the man. He was the oldest. He was the best looking. He had all of these things going for him. He knew that everybody knew that he was going to be the one who would be crowned king. Verse 6 goes on to say, When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, Surely... This is the Lord's anointed. But then the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. And then there is this very, very powerful verse. It says this, The Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? What's it say? At the heart. The Lord always looks at the heart. You see, folks, God looked at Eliab and he said, you not the man. You not the man. And Eliab just couldn't believe it because he was the one that was most likely to succeed. And I just wonder, folks, do you understand this story? Because what this story is all about is God sees things in you that others don't see. God sees things in those of you that are on the stream right now that other people don't see, but God sees them and he wants to use them. God loves to use the most unlikely. In fact, the passage of scripture around Jesus' life that encourage me the most are the ones that deal with who Jesus chose to be his 12 disciples, who he chose to be his closest friends, the ones who would actually move the church forward. If you read the Bible, what you'll notice in all of these stories is who he didn't pick. Jesus did not pick the smartest, the best looking, the ones that were the most religious, the most spiritual. He did not choose the most talented, the most gifted, the most likely to succeed. Jesus chose 12 sinful, ordinary, insecure, unlikely people to follow him. People just like you and people like me. He chose the smelly fishermen. He chose crooked accountants. He chose political activists. And Jesus' friends were the most unlikely people that you could ever imagine to come together to start a movement that would change the entire world. They were the partiers of his day. They were the liars of his day. They were the ones who the religious crowd despised. And that actually encourages me. So if you've ever felt like me before, if you've ever felt insecure, if you've ever felt other people thought you were not enough or you don't measure up or you don't have what it takes, if you ever have felt like your best isn't quite good enough, embrace this thought that God has chosen you to make a difference in this world. God has chosen you to make a difference in this world. Folks, God doesn't look at things that everybody else looks at. He sees the things that others don't see. Because God specializes in using the unlikely. Now, back to our story uh, with Samuel. Samuel calls up Eliab, and God says, he not the man. 
And Samuel's like, serious, God? And then he's like, okay, well, he's got eight sons all together, so let's line up the next ones. And so he lines up number two, you not the man. Number three, number four, number five, all the way up to number seven. You not the man, you not the man, you not the man. It's like an American Idol judge, you know, that says, nah, you don't have it. Get off the stage. And that's what he does with seven contestants. And Samuel's overwhelmed, believing like, God, why did you even send me here? And it's at that time that he asks Jesse, he says, Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And almost like an afterthought, you hear the doubt that I doubt if he could ever use him. Jesse says, well, there still is my youngest. Uh, Think about it. He doesn't even say his name. He says the names of all the other sons. If you read it closely, he never says his name. He just says he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. And at this point, you can just see the doubt. Well, I think God picked the wrong family. It must have been a different family, the family down the road, not our family because, you know, it's this. And he doubts that David could ever be the one that God would use as the next king. And yet, David becomes the greatest king of all of Israel. In fact... To Jesus, he becomes his great, 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 great. If you go 38 greats all the way, Jesus' great 38th grandpa. So who does God most often use? He most often uses people who are insecure. God uses the unlikely. And then lastly, God uses failures. God loves to use people who have failed in some area of their life. Folks, if you've ever failed before, I've got good news for you. And the good news is, is that you are a perfect candidate to be used by God. In fact, if you look at one of the most successful failures ever in the Bible, I would say it would be this guy named Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest followers and one of his friends, but Peter was the kind of person who often allowed his mouth to run, and I can relate to him, in such a way that he would get into trouble. And one day, Peter pulls Jesus aside and he starts bragging to him about how faithful he will be. He pulls him aside and he says, hey, Jesus, like all these other guys, these other 11, they're good guys, but they're just not always going to be there for you. But I'm going to be with you always. I will never turn my back on you. I will die with you. Whatever you need, Jesus, I've got your back. And Jesus listened to all of this. And he's like, one day he pulls Peter aside. He goes, Peter, Peter, you might say that. But the truth is, um, Not only once, but twice, actually three times, you're going to deny that you even know me. And after the end of that, you'll know and remember this, because at the end of the third denial, what you'll hear is this. There's going to be a rooster that crows. Peter's like, no way, Jesus, I'll never do this. I'll never walk away. I'll always have your back. And I hate roosters right now, you know. It's like, I'll never do that. And then on the night of Jesus' trial, a man comes up to Peter and he says, hey, do you know this guy, Jesus? He says, no, I don't know him. And two other people come up and say, well, do you know him? He goes, no, I don't know him. Finally, it tells us that In Luke chapter 22, Peter says, man, I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. And just as he's speaking, the Bible says, the rooster crowed. Cock-a-doodle-doo. And the Lord turned directly straight at Peter. Can you imagine what that moment must have been like for Peter? Scripture actually says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. I failed the Lord. Now, I don't know for sure what was going through his mind, but I can tell you that if 
I had been in that situation, this is what would have gone through mine. I, I screwed up big time. I mean, Jesus warned me, and, and I just didn't listen to him. He actually told me, he said, you're going to be my rock, Peter. And now I just feel like silly putty. I, I have nothing at all. He believed in me, and I let him down. I've destroyed our relationship. I have no credibility whatsoever. Again, Jesus will never, ever trust me again. I failed to Folks, if you failed, congratulations, because you're a great person to be used by God. Uh, sometimes people will come to the jar for the first time, and they'll come up to me, and they're like, oh, man, this is awesome. You're doing so great, and I bet you've never failed in ministry. And folks, my whole ministry has been this, failure upon failure upon failure upon failure. Many of you know that we started this church in our home and we grew this church to about 25 people after the first year. And I had this idea, we'll go to the YMCA and we'll just continue to see growth. And we go to the Y and the first couple of months, everything's okay. And then after the first couple of months, it goes down to eight people. And it stayed that way for months upon end. And I felt like such a failure. I was ready to throw in the towel. I was done. I didn't want to do it anymore. When we went public as a church about six months after that, I had this great idea that we would take 39,000 flyers and put them into Sunday's paper. Uh, are there papers anymore? Well, there must not have been very many back then either. We put 39,000 of these in the Sunday paper. We put them all over the place. We spent thousands and thousands of dollars. Do you know how many people told us that they came to the jar because of the flyer that we spent thousands of dollars on? Zero. Zero. Zilch. Nada. I wasted people's money. Thousands of dollars I wasted. I blew it. So, guess what? You're going to blow it. You're going to flub up. You're going to mess up. You're going to screw up in this thing called life. In fact, some of you are hurting so deeply right now because of something in your past, something you've done. For some of you, maybe it's a relational thing that you did, something that you failed in. There might be a divorce that you went through or something painful that happened. And you might say, well, the church turned their back on me when I was going through this. But folks, this is what I want you to know, that God never turns his back on you. He loves you. Divorce, scandal, whatever it is, he doesn't walk away and he can still use you. I know some people who have had huge embarrassment financially. Maybe you had to file for bankruptcy or foreclosure came to your house. Or maybe you're there right now and you're struggling financially and you're like, I just doubt if God could ever use someone like me. Maybe for others of you, it has to do with some kind of uh, thing within your job right now. And you know that what's going on is not good, but you keep doing it over and over and over again. And you're like, well, I don't think God could ever use me. And if you stood up and you told the truth, God might be able to use you in an incredible, incredible way. Because this is what I know. This is who God uses. God uses Moses. He was a murderer. God uses David. He was an adulterer. God uses Peter, who denied Jesus three times. And he loves to use people who are insecure, who are unlikely, who sometimes fail. You know, what's humbling to me about Peter is that when Jesus came back to him to forgive him, and he immediately says, Peter, you're still my rock. You're going to be the one that we use to build the church. The failure, Peter stands up on Pentecost, the birth of the church. And this is what he taught. He said, repent. In other words, turn away from those things that you've messed up on because I've messed up a lot, Peter says. So repent from that and be baptized. Some of you, today I'm teaching a class on baptism. You should do it. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
Now, why do you think Peter chose to be so passionate about talking about forgiveness on the first day of the church? Because he had been forgiven so much. He had been forgiven greatly by Jesus. And this is what the Bible teaches. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Imagine that. Maybe the biggest failure in the entire New Testament, maybe the entire Bible, became the most successful failure. Folks, God wants to use every single person in this auditorium and everyone on the stream. You may say, okay, well, well, well okay, I want God to do something big. I want him to do something big in my life. And, and I would caution you, don't ask for God to do something big. Ask him actually to do something small, something stupidly small. Because small things done with great love will change the world. You know, one of the biggest ways that I believe that God has used me recently was in a very, very small way. Several months ago, a woman comes for the very first time and introduces herself to me. And, and I get her name. And sometimes I don't always remember people's names. And the woman kept coming a couple of weeks more, and I'd see and I'd wave. And one day she came, and for some reason I remembered her name, or at least I thought I did. And, and so when she came by, I just said, hey, so-and-so, how are you doing? And immediately the woman starts crying. I thought, oh, man, I said her wrong name. Or maybe it's the name of a person that died in her life or, you know, someone who hurt her, whatever, and she's crying kind of uncontrollably, and I'm like, are, are you okay? And then she said this, I'll never forget it. She said, you remembered my name. I thought no one knew my name. And then she said this, I feel invisible, but today I feel seen. And this woman is growing in her faith, and she accepted Christ a few months ago, and, and her life is, has been changing. And it was a very, very small thing that I did. I just noticed her, and I remembered her name. And God is moving in her life. Today, some of you, I hope, will not choose to try to say, I'm going to do something gigantic and big, but you'd say, I want to start with something small. Because the small stuff, folks, makes the biggest difference. So, wherever God puts your heart, whatever he places within your spirit, just do that. For some of you, you might step out in faith today and say, you know what? They talk about volunteering and they need someone to help with something. I'm going to step out and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that small little thing just once a month, come early or stay a little late, and I'm going to serve in that area. For others of you, maybe you would step out and you would say, you know what? I'm going to get plugged into a small group. I hear them talking about small groups all the time, but this is the time I'm actually going to do it. I'm going to take that step and I'm going to get plugged into a small group. Maybe for others of you, it might be financially. You've been coming and you're like, you know what? We should probably give something financially. And some of you today, you might make that decision to give something on the app. You can always give on the app or to go uh, to the black boxes when you leave the lobby. And you say, hey, I'm going to give today. I'm going to do that one small thing. You make a difference in this world. Maybe for others of you, that card that I talked about inviting someone, I'm going to do it this week. I'm going to take a picture of it. I'm going to send it. I'm going to say, hey, you know what? We're doing this series on doubt. I have doubts. Maybe you do too. I thought you might come and their life could be changed. Today, God wants to use every single person, every single person who he's created. He loves to be able to use for them to not say, I doubt if God could use me. No, God can use you. And the reason he does this is because you are are his masterpiece. 
He loves to use insecure people. He loves to use the most unlikely people. He loves to use people who've had failures in their life. Because all of us, every one of us, we are God's masterpiece. If you would, in your program, I'd like you to pull out this little, uh, little rear view mirror card that says, I'm God's masterpiece. I am God's masterpiece. Now, if you didn't get one and you're like, hey, I'd like one of those, when you leave today, uh, just pick up a program. Our greeters will be back there. They'll be able to get it. For those of you on the stream, uh, stop by the church office. We'll have tons of these. And what I want to challenge you is that you've got these thoughts to remember that God uses the insecure, he uses the unlikely, he uses the failures, but sometimes we need to be reminded who we are. And so I want to challenge you to take this and to place it on your rear view mirror in your car. That's where mine's going to go. Or maybe you would say, no, that's not me. I'll put it on my refrigerator or I'll put it on my computer or I'll put it on the, uh, you know, uh, on the mirror in the bathroom. Where, wherever it is that you're going to see this, And you remind yourself again and again who you are. That you are not what other people say you are. You are not what other people say. You are God's masterpiece. And he loves to use people who have insecurities, who feel like they're the most unlikely, and who have failed in their life. And when you are tempted by the evil one, and the evil one says, I doubt if God could use you, you just be reminded of wherever you put this, no, he can, because I am his masterpiece. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done in this teaching. And Holy Spirit, I pray right now, more than anything else, that you would do your work now in people's lives. That people here today who in their doubts, in their failures, in their insecurities, that they would be reminded that you have chosen them. You've called them by name, that they're your masterpiece. Now today, maybe there are some of you who the truth is, you're like, what, I'm so insecure. I feel unlikely. I I feel like a failure. That if that's you, and you're like, I want to believe though, I want to understand that I'm his masterpiece, that I can be used by him. I'm going to ask you to do a bold thing. And that is with no one looking around, just say, I want to believe that. I'm struggling to. I want to, to just raise your hand and say, that's me. That, that's me. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for each person with a raised hand. I pray right now that you would remind them that regardless of how insecure or unlikely or how much they failed in life, that you want to use them. In spite of their doubts, God, would you give them the courage to say, use me, God. I am your masterpiece. Do it now, God, for your honor and glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, maybe there are some of you that you're separated from God right now. The truth is, is that you have never really made a commitment to Christ. You just always felt unworthy that you weren't enough. I'm too insecure. I'm, I'm unlikely. I'm, I'm all of this. But you realize today, I need him in my life. I need to understand that I'm not junk, that I'm actually a masterpiece, that no matter what other people say or those mean, evil thoughts that I place in my mind, those down kind of plain thoughts that, no, 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 I'm going to change my thought life, but I need Jesus in my life to do that. And if that's you, if today's your day where you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a prayer. Because scripture tells us that anyone, 
And that includes you. Those of you on the stream, everyone in a seat right now, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. They'll be made whole. They'll be made complete. They'll be known as a masterpiece of God that he created them. And if that's you, if today's your day where you're like, I I need his love, I need his grace, I need his forgiveness, I want to lead you in a prayer. But it's not a prayer that you pray by yourself, but one that we pray together. And I invite you, if you feel comfortable, just to bow your head and to repeat this prayer after me. Loving God, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I believe you died and rose again so I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I could follow you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.